stop talking about the right to free speech and stop criticizing the Democrats and give us more, you know, critical theory and more in-depth critical theory. And I'm like, no, you don't deserve it. If you can't understand that free speech is important, you could never understand Horkheimer. Uh, maybe I'll cut all this out uh, or a good portion. The part where I tell my audience they don't deserve good things. Yeah, I would, I would cut that part out. The death of God is about the drying up of a horizon of meaning and of a whole form of human life. Where do we stand in the illusion it makes? What kind of space are we invited into? The material relations between people become social relations between things. When we look at toasters, corn, and TVs, we don't we see We still, to a large extent, live in the interregnum between, between worlds, if you will, or between paradigms. Not many people in the history of the world have faced that. Diet Soap is a Sublation Media podcast. Benjamin Studebaker is a political theorist from the University of Cambridge. He is involved with two podcasts, Political Theory 101 and The Lack. As a writer, he has contributed to Current Affairs, Aeon, The New Republic, and Sublation Magazine, amongst others. And his new book from Paul Grave is entitled The Chronic Crisis of American Democracy, The Way It's Shut. Benjamin Studebaker, thank you for coming on to the Diet Soap podcast. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. Yeah. Do you have anything you want to add to that bio? Anything I should have said that I didn't? Oh, yeah. people can can pick different things that I've done that they like or don't like. It's all fine by me. Okay, great. Um, so your book, The Chronic Crisis of American Democracy, The Way It's Shut. Is there a reason to to read this book other than wanting to to just get depressed? I mean, do you, is, what what was the aim of writing a book where you conclude, although you don't actually really conclude this, but where you seem to conclude that there just is no possibility for any political change in America? Yeah, so I think that we need to move through some stages of grief to get to a point where we can really think about what's going on in American politics in a constructive way. Mm -hmm. I think the kind of hope phase, which we might associate with Bernie in 2016 or Obama in 2008, or for people on the right, they might associate it with Trump. This period where we imagine if we can just get the right person elected president, or we can uh, you know, just win a few elections, string a few things together, we can reform the system and make it work a lot better. I think a lot of people have gotten to a point where they recognize that that no longer looks realistic or feasible. But then uh, the pivot tends to be into a fear mentality where the thought is, well, we're not going to win, but we have to vote for uh, centrist Democrats because otherwise the other side's going to win and the other side is uh, capable of visiting all kinds of terrible, horrible stuff upon us. So therefore we have to uh, continue to support the political establishment, continue to participate in the Democratic Party process and in uh, the American political system, give our energy and our time to it uh, to prevent these other people from winning. And I think that this, this fear is kind of the reverse coin of hope. We no longer have hope that we're going to win, but we have fear that other people's hopes are well-founded. Mm -hmm. And the point I want to make in this book is that the American political system is so dysfunctional, that it's not really a system in which either the left or the right can win in any kind of meaningful way. It's a system where there's a constant appearance of meaningful conflict, but ultimately there's a set of structural incentives and imperatives that lead you back to the same place no matter what you try to do. And I think if we can get into real proper despair about the American political system and what it's capable of doing, not just in terms of what it's capable of doing positively, but also in terms of what it's capable of doing negatively, then we might be able to start to think about this problem as it really exists. It's a system that doesn't move very fast, very far, very quickly in any particular direction. It's not very dynamic. It's not very adaptable. And it's not really fit for purpose. What is the unsolvable problem 
that you mentioned in the first chapter of your book. Yeah, so the unsolvable problem is uh, basically as capital mobility increases, as it becomes easier for oligarchs and corporations to move jobs and investment from country to country and from place to place, this creates uh, a strong competitive incentive for states which are territorially bounded, are tied to land and can't move around to make tax, trade, wage, labor policy in a way that caters to these wealthy oligarchs and corporations to try to induce those people to locate jobs and investment in those territories. And the effect of this over time is that wages get pushed down, tax rates get pushed down, and then that in turn leads to cuts to public services, erosion of uh, the size of the public sector workforce, the quality of the public sector jobs, the quality of the pensions that people in public sector jobs receive. And gradually this uh, produces more dysfunction in the society and that subjects uh, people of almost every class and background apart from these oligarchs to an enormous amount of psychological stress. And that psychological stress plays an increasingly dominant role in guiding and determining the way people from these different classes and backgrounds participate in democratic politics. And it gradually destroys the capacities of people, I think, to engage in politics in a constructive, strategic way. And so as this uh, problem worsens, it gets harder and harder to imagine this system doing anything uh, that could resolve the problem in any way, limiting capital mobility, in part because any state that tries to rein in capital mobility, uh, that tries to change fundamentally the way trading relationships work or the way tax rates work, that state's engaged in an uncompetitive practice. So it has to find a way to get other states to cooperate with it in doing all of that. And if it can't get other states to cooperate with it, then its attempts to rein in these things will just put it at a competitive disadvantage. At Bold 3 Detergent Plus Fabric Softener. Oh, like Sublation Media is coming to New York City. On August 18th and 19th, we'll be hosting events at Columbia University in Room 517 in Hamilton Hall. On August 18th, Sorab Amari from Compact Magazine and our own Chris Catrone will be discussing their books, The Death of the Millennial Left, and Tyranny Incorporated from 5 to 7 p.m. Other panelists will include myself as a moderator, Ashley Frawley, and Jacob Siegel, the author of the essay, A Guide to Understanding the Hoax of the Century. On the 19th, Chris Catron will discuss his book, The Death of the Millennial Left, and Room 517 from 3 to 5 p.m., taking questions from the audience. See Sublation Media sublate the current moment in New York City. We can sublate it there. We can sublate it anywhere. Why psychological stress, particularly? Why? I mean, doesn't it put many people in different from different walks of life under real economic or physical material stress as well? Oh yeah. So for a lot of people, it's a straightforward argument to do with material stress. If you mm. aren't getting paid enough if your a job is too precarious, if you're worried about losing your job, these things, of course, are going to stress you out. The reason I emphasize a, a more holistic psychological stress angle is that there are a lot of people out there who will go, oh, but not everybody who is voting for the left or the right is under uh, obvious economic material stress. So if you look at, say, Trump voters, many Trump voters have a relatively high incomes. They're not uh, poor people. They're retired people. They're uh, people who run small businesses. They're petty bourgeois. What kind of psychological, you know, what kind of economic stress are they under? So I want to emphasize that the system causes stress, not just insofar as it subjects people to material want. That's one of the ways it does it. And I think in particular workers uh, who haven't been to college or what I call uh, fallen professionals, people with college degrees who haven't been able to use those college degrees to obtain elite or, or high status jobs those people are straightforwardly under a lot of economic stress. But in addition to that, I think there's also additional forms of psychological stress that come out of the capitalist system that are not as directly tied to the experience of precarity or poverty. 
Uh, things like, for instance, if you run a small business and you're in a local community where the workers and the fallen professionals aren't getting paid very well, they don't have as much income, uh, there are economic crises to do with people taking on too much debt, this creates an uncertainty about the future of your business and a concern that over time this situation will get worse and it will no longer be possible for you to run a business in that area uh, as crime rates uh, go up, as people are driven into uh, crime by want. That creates, again, uncertainty and, and uh, unease on the part of these business people, that their businesses are going to uh, be victimized by shoplifters. Uh, these law and order concerns that small business owners get come out of the fact that small business owners are stuck in particular communities that are geographically situated. They can't easily move all over the world like oligarchs and corporations can. And this becomes a leverage point. If you're someone who runs a small business, you sell burgers, right? You can't make the burgers in China and then sell them in New York. You can't move your burger shop wherever the money is good. Uh, but what oligarchs will say to you is, hey, if there is an increase in tax rates, if there's an increase in wages, uh, I'm going to be able to handle that because I'm a transnational oligarch. But you're not going to be able to handle that because you're a small business owner who's stuck in a particular local situation. And so people who are trapped geographically, who aren't able to move in the way that capital can move, who can't move their money and resources easily, these people will also be subjected to stress, even if they're not poor or precarious in the straightforward material senses we usually so talk about. So when you say psychological stress, you don't mean, oh, <clears throat> I feel badly and I feel anxiety because... I, you know, I was um, I wasn't breastfed when I was a baby or or something like that. It's not some inner Oedipal drama you're talking about, but really a, a, the because we have the ability to predict consequences into that might happen in the future. There's a kind of precarity that arises even amongst people who in a moment may have just enough or more than enough to get by. Is that. Would that be a fair yeah. way to characterize After it? 2016, there were a lot of people who tried to draw up a dichotomy between economic explanations mm -hmm. for Trump's success and cultural mm -hmm. explanations. Mm -hmm. And one of their key arguments is, well, there are people who voted for Trump who have high incomes. Uh, and therefore, how could those people be motivated by the economy? How could capitalism have anything to do with their voting behavior? Mm -hmm. And I want to complexify that narrative and emphasize that there's not just first order effects of the economic system. There's also second and third order effects. The other the other thing to point out about those high income voters that voted for Trump is that a lot of the voting blocks are just fixed. They 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 are Republican voters, no matter who the candidate is, the, these high income voters in say middle America are always going to vote Republican. And th there's high income voters in blue states that are always going to vote for Democrats or, you know, other voting blocks that apparently will always vote for one party or another. So the question is around the independent voters and the voters that change affiliation and the, the and the and the new voters. And so to figure out what their motivations, like what made it the difference, what was consequential, you have to look to them and you have to look at what their psychological stresses are and material stresses are, don't you think? So that changes yeah. the picture a lot. I think there are, if you look at, is it the case that um, the new voters for Trump, the people who either switched from Obama to Trump or who voted for the first time, uh, were they by and large wealthy individuals? Do you know? Uh, it's, it's a mixed picture. There are places where you can make an argument about uh, working class voters voting for Trump. There are other places where that argument wouldn't fit as neatly. In, in my experience, and, you know, I live in Indiana, so there's a lot of Trump voters around. There are mm -hmm. Trump voters of both types. There are people who are doing, uh, who are affluent, but who are not oligarchs, who are not fabulously wealthy, who feel economically tied to the, the country or to their local community, who see their community as uh, menaced in various ways by uh, global trade or global movement, migration, immigration, various forms of movement. And they mm -hmm. feel that their community 
uh, and that they, because they're rooted in that community, are limited in their ability to cope with the effects of those changes, these rapid flows of people and money around the world. And I think that that extends both to working class people who are worried about, say, uh, having their wages undercut by uh, migrant laborers or who are worried about off, uh, uh, offshoring or outsourcing of jobs to uh, countries in Asia. But it also extends to more affluent people who are, when they're looking at their money, they're not really thinking about themselves as a part of global capital. They're thinking of themselves as someone who did well in a particular place, who's embedded in a particular place and committed to that place and would not be comfortable so easily moving to another country if this country weren't doing so well. Mm -hmm. So um, you write that it became necessary for American elites to come up with an explanation for let's say Trumpism or for the rise of populism that didn't engage with the economic context, uh, which in which it arose. And, you know, uh, this dichotomy between cultural explanations and material explanations, um, is what came out of that, I think, because before then almost everyone understood the, the, these two things as connected, one being almost a reaction to the other. Um, why did it become necessary for elites to uh, move away from a dialectical understanding of the you know, of, of the causes of po for populism? Uh, what what limited the maybe this is a question that's going to get you to talk about later parts of the book? But what limited um, the political class from addressing uh, those underlying economic conditions? Yeah, so I think, yet, uh, for one, I think that a lot of people in the uh, you know, political establishment have the view, a kind of 90s Fukuyama view, that there really isn't any alternative to the system that we have, uh, not just to, say, democracy uh, or to capitalism in a general sense, but to a kind of neoliberal capitalism in which there's a high level of capital mobility, a high level of international trade, and a high level of competition among states to attract capital. And uh, they feel that there's no alternative to this, both in the sense that you know, politically it would not be, uh, normatively it wouldn't be acceptable to them, but also they think that if you were to try to deviate and to do something else, that it would be absolutely ruinous. And once it became clear that a lot of the populist candidates were interested in doing something to disrupt capital mobility, uh, that they were talking about potentially severing trade links, restructuring trade relationships, creating a context in which it would be much easier to control uh, tax rates without uh, these competitive effects, that made it much, much less acceptable for them to entertain uh, any kind of, of compromise, even performatively with any sort of alternative. I think that was a, a significant factor. Uh, I think, moreover, mm. there's an enormous amount of wealth that pours through these two parties. And while this wealth often has an interest in pretending to be interested in some kind of change for the purposes of generating enthusiasm among voters, if it actually gets that close to happening, if people start to win in the Democratic Party or in the Republican Party who are interested in major change, whether that's a unilateral strategy where a country tries to break itself off from the system or a multilateral strategy where multiple countries try to get together to reform the system, once it starts to become something that really could happen rather than just a way of chasing up votes, opposition tends to solidify. Well, what is it about globalization that is particularly uh, a problem uh, now in a way? That, and how has it not always been a problem? It, global trade or globalization has been de de defining capitalism and modernity since at the very least the late 19th century. Um, well, so with why the is exception it of the, the major disruption that occurred during the World Wars era, where the World Wars made it actively unsafe to move money around the world, uh, made it actively unsafe to trade in the ocean, and made countries suspicious of each other and more inclined to try to be self-sufficient. And so during that stretch, because there was a lack of mobility of capital, 
rich people were trapped. They were not able to easily move their money from country to country in response to tax policy they didn't like or labor policy they didn't like. And all of that gave domestic workers in these countries a lot more leverage because those rich people couldn't just go and get workers somewhere else to do the work. Uh, they had to negotiate with their workers at home. And so coming out of the 30s and 40s, we had substantial concessions uh, on the basis of this lack of capital mobility. And also on the basis that you know, the Russian revolution happened, it seemed like it was really the case that if they didn't make concessions, that there could be revolutionary activity that work, the workers could come together and actually impose some alternative political system in which they would be straightforwardly expropriated. And what's changed since this you know, period of mid-century leveling between about 1930 and 1980, or if you wanted to start it at the beginning of the First World War, 1914 and 1980, what's really changed is that capital mobility has increased dramatically. It started increasing almost immediately after the end of World War II with the GATT rounds and the trade negotiations that gradually made it easier and easier for oligarchs and corporations to take the money and move it offshore. That, in combination with the fading of any real possibility that this political system might be replaced by, with something like the Soviet system. The Soviet system no longer appears as a credible alternative to our system. There's no sizable number of people, even on the left, who are interested in something like the Soviet system. And no other alternative system has really emerged that people believe in as an alternative to the political system that we have. Yeah, there's no widespread uh, support or enthusiasm uh, for some other hypothetical system. And also when people look around the world at the other systems that exist in states like Russia or China or Iran, none of those systems are inspiring to people living in Western countries. Nobody in Western countries is looking at those systems really and going, oh yeah, let's implement a political there are, system. There are a few. Yeah people in Western countries that will look to China. I know some of them and yeah. say that they're inspired by it, but, but it's not. But if a, you were to I mean, poll people, when you poll people and ask them, you know, what, what's your opinion on the Chinese system of government? What's the favorability rating for Xi Jinping or for China? The numbers are very low, uh, mm -hmm. almost as low as the numbers for Russia and Vladimir Putin. Right. Um, when you, uh, well, what, what I, What's interesting is that, um, well, first of all, I don't think that uh, completely isolating all the different nations in the world into their own borders and not exchanging uh, goods and services is a, a very viable political vision uh, that, you know, globalization has a, a big upside beyond these downsides that you're, you're talking about. So, oh, I agree. Uh, yeah. This is what makes it so difficult. If you try to break a country off and go your own way, what will happen is that you'll disrupt the supply chains and the cost of goods and services will rise astronomically. You'll get a ton of inflation, and then the elected government will struggle to manage the consequences of that inflation uh, politically. In the UK, where they did Brexit, the effect of Brexit, even with a deal that mitigates to a significant degree the amount of disruption that Brexit causes, is a higher inflation rate than other countries and a lower growth rate than other countries, and an economic situation where the per capita GDP is lower today than it was in 2007. So in that situation, it's really difficult for any sitting government in the UK to win an election. And when other countries look at what has happened in the UK, uh, other uh, parties and other, other uh, leaders look at that and go, that doesn't seem like a very viable strategy. At the same time, if you try a multilateral approach, it's very difficult to get large numbers of governments elected at the same time interested in making major revisions to the system. And this is why the point I want to make is not just, oh, you know, if only we could get somebody elected who was committed to either a multilateral or a unilateral approach. My, my point is, moreover, you cannot, with this kind of political system, do the kinds of things that are necessary to actually make things better for people. Because of the way you get trapped by the economic realities of the current system, yeah. which you say are neoliberal, but which also could be, uh, you know, in, in a different context, uh, you, you wouldn't necessarily have to have neoliberal policies, but you could just still have some sort of system of competition and exchange between nations um, uh, without 
you know, in a relatively open way. I mean, the other thing is we're not, it's not as though right now every nation participates in an equal way in the global economy, right? So in a way, we have multilateral competition between oh, already. I say in the book, it would be better to do a multilateral change than a unilateral change, because if we had multiple countries cooperating together on new rules for international trade, then we wouldn't have the major inflationary spikes and major disruptions that come from unilaterally pulling out. It's just that politically, it's very difficult to do multilateralism. And so oftentimes, if you're trying to get leverage in negotiations with other states, you'll start talking about, well, if this doesn't work, if I can't get you to agree to change the system, I may have to withdraw from that system. And Mélenchon in France had this issue, right, where he has plan A and plan B. Plan A is let's you know, negotiate a new set of terms for how the European Union works and how we get along, right? But if we can't negotiate those new terms because other states like, say, Germany won't agree to new terms, then we have to credibly threaten to leave. Now, if you actually do leave, it will cause economic devastation. Mélenchon's government would be very unlikely to, to survive actually doing Frexit, right? But if it tries to negotiate without the leverage that's provided by a credible commitment to leaving, Germany will call France's bluff and go, eh, you're not actually going to leave. We don't agree to change the rules. And this is the sticky spot that you get in. Even if Mélenchon were elected, which he couldn't even get elected, even if he were elected, he would then be faced with this situation where either he would have to pledge to threaten to commit economic suicide, or mm -hmm. he would have to somehow get the Germans to agree in the absence of any kind of credible threat. And the inside. Foreclose that Tristan law. The School of Materialist Research is a self-sustainable platform where ideas are discussed in ways that would not be possible in conventional academia. The school is defined by its interest in the materialist approach to knowledge. Among its faculty are Julia Kristeva, Amanda Beach, Ben Woodward, Thomas Nail, and Paul Cockshot. The deadline for applications is September 4th, 2023. Check out the link to the School of Materialist Research in the description for this video. Well, you would need a coalition of of uh, European nations that would make this demand together. Right. And they That's all have to be elected at the same time. And in France and Spain and Italy and Greece, there are parties that would be interested in this. But at any given time, maybe only one or two of them is actually in power. So every time there's an actual moment of truth where either you, you put up or shut up, there aren't enough of these governments around at the same time for the government to feel like it has the leverage to negotiate. Well, that's why you need an international working class movement that can put pressure on the, their governments, regardless of who's in power and make these demands rather than relying on some elite to take the right elite to take power at a given moment, probably. But let's let's I'm, I'm going to move on to some other aspects of your book. and Maybe we can come back to this larger question. What, why did you define workers as wage earners? who didn't go to college. Uh, and then later on, you kind of mitigate this. But in a two, six, 2016 report, uh, it seemed to indicate that uh, a quarter of the workforce has attended college. And more recently, uh, a nonprofit named Luminin, uh, Lumina actually indicates that over half of working adults have some college education. I think that nonprofit may be less reputable than the labor statistics I was getting from the state. But nonetheless, a good portion of the working class has college, a college degree or of some kind or another. Why this distinction between the uneducated workers and the educated workers? Yeah, some of that's going to depend on whether, for instance, we count people with associate's degrees in right. one no, or the other. Right. We, they're, they're counting with the 51 percent. Certainly they're counting associate's degrees, but they should. Yeah. That's real education. Don't don't knock your. Oh, it's, it's real education. But does it give you the specific set of interests that you have if you're in the professional class? I'm not sure, because someone who goes for an associate's degree isn't going for an associate's degree for the same precise reasons that someone who, say, goes for a bachelor's degree in, say, history. Uh, right. Goes. The, yeah. Their intentions are somewhat different when they go into can, that degree. And so what they come you, out of it with is a little bit different. Can you get an associate's degree in history? I am not sure you can. Huh. It would be different, certainly, if you did, because it would be a two-year degree and not a four-year degree. Right. And it would be aimed at probably getting you into a four-year program. That's what I would right. think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
Now, none of this is to say somebody's you know, better or worse than anybody else. The reason I draw this distinction is because I think there is a uh, antagonism that exists now, not that we want it to exist, not that it should exist, between people with college degrees and people who don't have college degrees. And I make this distinction and I argue that these fallen professionals, people who have college degrees but are not in professional managerial roles, who are not in the elite roles in the society, these declassed or proletarianized professionals are in, to some degree, not able to accept their proletarian condition. They hold on to the idea that because they went to college, they're better in some way than the people who didn't go. They learn a set of uh, terms, a way of talking about social and political issues while they're in school. And they lord this language over people who didn't go to college. And so in practice, when left-wing organizations try to form, if they include fallen professionals and traditional workers in the same outfit, what will usually happen is that the fallen professionals will talk over the workers and eventually drive the workers out of the organization. And the organization will become overwhelmingly just a place for college educated workers. And we can see this in organizations like the DSA, where the membership is overwhelmingly college educated. There is an enormous difficulty with getting traditional workers to join or to stay in the organization. And yet, whenever there's talk about what's the demographic character of organizations like the DSA, the focus of the conversation tends to be on, well, what is the race of the people in the organization? What's the sexuality of the people in the organization? What's the income level of people in the organization? What's the gender of people in the organization? It doesn't tend to focus on this question of education. And part of the reason is that people who have college degrees want to say that they're workers when it's convenient to say that they're workers, uh, but also want to hang on to this distinctiveness and this authority that they think they get from having a degree and from being educated. Uh, and I understand it. It's very difficult if you commit yourself to getting a college degree, you take on a bunch of debt, and then you're not able to get the kind of job you envision. It's very difficult to get to the end of that, have an income that isn't dramatically higher than somebody who didn't go to college, be in a role in society that is arguably more precarious uh, and uh, less secure than, say, a factory job in the 60s or 70s, and to be doing that with a degree. Uh, that's really a, a very difficult position to be in. And our society tells people who are in this position that it's their fault, that they weren't competitive enough or smart enough or good enough, and that's why they're in that box. Uh, and it's very understandable that people in that situation would want to hang on to whatever cultural capital they got from the degree to give them a sense of, of distinctiveness. And I'm not trying to be uh, cruel or disparaging or negative about these people who are in this position. Nevertheless, politically, the fact that people are in this position creates an enormous problem because it makes it very, very hard for them to tolerate organizing alongside people who haven't been to college, don't speak the language, and can't play the game. They keep stopping the political work of the organization so that they can scold the person who hasn't been to college for not having gone to college and not having learned the language. And what that eventually does is it drives those people out. And I call this in the book, McGovernization, the tendency for left-wing organizations, movements, campaigns to over time become more and more focused on college educated professionals and their cultural preferences at the expense of traditional workers. So when you say that the college educated people talk over the uneducated workers, um, do you think that happens? It's not happening because college educated people consciously just feel that they're superior, right? Or it's more that because the language from the workers isn't as refined or the way the approach from uneducated workers might seem simplistic, maybe the college educated group is impatient and wants to move to some higher level. You think that, I mean, is well, that they, they make participating in their organization and being able to do political work conditional on speaking the university language. So is it just a matter of language, like like a convention or is there some substance, some substantial difference in the complexity of thought or the depth of knowledge or the reach 
of the understanding that might be amongst the college educated. I'm going to just go ahead and take this elitist position and say, yeah. hey, you know, if you haven't been to college, you maybe are not equipped to deal with the realities of the world in the same way that someone who has been. And maybe even to go further, I'll say, if you've been to an Ivy League school or you went to Cambridge, you went to the finest universities in the world, you may have a, a, a both an innate ability and uh, depth of knowledge. It puts you in a per- superior position to some guy who went to Portland Community College, like I did for a few years, uh, to deal with the complexities of the world. So, therefore, you ought to be listened to more. What do you what do you make of that? Well, I would say <laughs> this. I would say that regardless of how you feel about it and whether you're right or wrong about mm. what you have, and there are some people who went to college who know a, a great deal and have very informed perspectives. There are other people who think they know a lot and don't really, and mm. have just kind of picked up a set of prejudices really from going to college, mm. uh, who haven't really learned to think from themselves and don't really have the full kind of education that we imagine that people are supposed to get when they go to college, in part mm. because the university system is gradually becoming less and less interested in giving people that kind of education and more interested in giving them job coupons and uh, in in telling them that they're educated and in encouraging them to think of themselves as thought leaders when they really haven't received what they're actually supposed right. to. Right. I wanted to get this is what I was trying to get at is that you're saying yeah. something about college as well as about um, the the working class who are uneducated. You're saying that the because of maybe even the because of the poverty of college education, people are more likely to lean on a, a symbolic use of language as a signifier of status rather yeah. than uh you know be able to listen to people who don't use that language and find the substance in it um there's there's a shallowness between in the college educated and which we don't even know if it exists in the working class or not um that you're pointing to right yeah there's a chapter in my book where i go through kind of how the concepts of liberty equality equity Uh, and representation are explored at universities. And uh, the tendency for these discussions to be flattened out for most students who go. Uh, Mm. Many students who go, of course, never actually take any classes on political concepts. You can go through, you know, say Purdue University and uh, be an engineer, and you might have a tokenistic civics class that's not that different from your high school government class. Uh, that is mandatory as part of a gen ed requirement. But basically, you can be an engineering student at Purdue and not really take any political classes to speak of. Uh, But even among those who do take political classes, even among those who major in political, social science, humanities subjects, the tendency is when these terms get introduced, for them to be introduced in very flat, propagandistic ways that induce people to think that they know what's going on when they don't really know. And Mm -hmm. So I give a few different examples of this in the book. I talk about, for instance, uh, the positive negative liberty binary that Isaiah Berlin sets up, borrowing Mm -hmm. from Benjamin Constant and the way in which that excludes a lot of other conceptualizations of liberty that come from, say, uh, Marx or the uh, neo-Republican tradition or uh, Quentin Skinner, the Cambridge School. There's a lot of different conceptions that get excluded by that positive negative dichotomy. I talk about it in relation to equality and equity, where you have this, you know, There are only two ways to understand how we distribute stuff, equality and equity. And here's a baseball stadium and and people behind a fence. And it's this or it's that. One of them is terrible. And why would anybody agree to that? And the other one's great. Everybody can see the game. So why would you prefer that one? There's a, a tendency to use these binaries where you have the good version of the concept and the bad version. You're supposed to reject the bad version and embrace the good version. So in that classic thing with the baseball field, Mm -hmm. Giving everybody the same amount of resources is the view associated with equality. And of course, if you give everyone the same resources, because some people have more resources to start with than others, some people don't benefit enough from receiving the same basket of resources and need more to be able to reach the same level, right? Therefore, the meme says, you ought to prefer equity where everybody gets to the same level and there's an equality of outcome. Now, those Mm -hmm. are two views, really. Uh, equal distribution of uh, resources, but it's not even really, because if you look in the literature at equal distribution of resources, people with that view actually mean ensuring everybody has the same level of resources. They don't mean giving everybody the same thing. They mean ensuring everybody at the end gets has the same level of resources uh, and equality of outcome. 
And what that does is it completely uh, obviates the dozens of other views about equality that exist in the literature that political mm -hmm. theorists debate about, talk about into this reductive binary where either you agree with this particular view or you are backward and reactionary and one of the bad people. One that view that framing it, it. Yeah. One view it overturns or overlooks, I think, is, is Marx's view. Yes. Which, you know, which is not aimed at either uh, equality of resources or equity in outcome, but uh, in something altogether different, which is the idea that one is could be as productive as possible and that what you try to do is create conditions where people can continually maximize their ability to participate and and receive from a society which is growing both intellectually and culturally and materially all the time. That's the kind of utopian Marxist view. Yeah, I, the, Marx put a lot of emphasis on freedom and he understood freedom a lot in terms of you know, non-domination. Mm -hmm. Domination being to do with uh, when you rely on somebody else, if you're an employee and you will rely on your employer for your wage, for your ability to get by in life, when you negotiate with your employer over that wage, because you rely on your employer and your employer can pick any number of people to do your job, the negotiation is heavily, heavily slanted toward your employer. You have much less leverage in that negotiation. And because of that, your employer dominates you. You have to be careful with your employer and you have to be careful not to upset your employer. And whenever there's any conversation between you and an employer, the employer has all the leverage. And that's uh, why there is a lack of freedom in a wage labor negotiation that to a libertarian looks like a completely equal uh, thing where there's two people, there's an agreement that they make and they both agree. Uh, and therefore, since they both agreed, isn't it fair? Uh, there, the capacity of the worker to refuse to agree is diminished by the fact that the worker has so limited resources that the worker will be put in a very bad position unless the worker agrees to some labor arrangement or other. And that background condition dominates the worker, that condition that comes out of the capitalist system dominates the worker, even independent of any particular person owning that worker as a slave or keeping that worker as a serf. So I want to ask you, uh, listen, uh, can you stick around for a second half? Because in about five minutes, I think we'll break and do, and I'll send you another stream for the Patreon part. Okay, great. So, um, uh, but I, so you mentioned that uneducated workers often engage with conspiracy theories in your book, and I want to know, like, how do you what counts as a conspiracy theory from your point of view? How are you using that idea in your book? Yeah, so what I think really makes a conspiracy theory not a critical theory is that conspiracy theories tend to attribute extensive agency and blame to particular individuals or groups, and it can be uh, religious groups, racial groups. That's what I think really makes a conspiracy theory a conspiracy theory. It centers blame on individuals and groups rather than making a broader structural critique of, say, capitalism. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, um, if you let's take Russiagate, if you're either side of it, like, let's say on the one hand, you think, oh, Putin and Trump uh, colluded to change the outcome of the 2016 election. Uh, Trump was Putin's Manchurian candidate. Uh, you, you know, the, it was a conspiracy between them. Uh, to change American politics, and that's what was most consequential in 2016. That's a that's a conspiracy theory, right? But yeah, yeah, I, I would agree with that. Yeah, and then the on the other side, if I say, well, uh, what happened actually was that was all a hoax. You know, I read the Durham report. There, Hillary Clinton's campaign actually created the Steele dossier. These are all facts, actually. To uh, fool the FBI into running an investigation into the Trump administration, which they were all you know, very happy to do. They were more than willing to oblige. Uh, and that created conditions for the state to create an apparatus of censorship and control, expanding the policies of war on terror, on, on the war of the war on terrorism and aiming them inward at the domestic population. And that's the, and that's the reason why that happened. Is that also a conspiracy theory? Well, there's questions about you know, what are the facts, what occurred, right. what took place, 
And mm -hmm. I'll be honest, on a lot of these uh, different issues that we talk about, mm -hmm. going into the weeds about what exactly happened is not my strong suit. Right, right. What, what I tend to focus on is, okay, if we can agree on what happened, which sometimes we can and sometimes we can't, then the question is, why did that happen? So we know that the 2016 election happened. Uh, and if we can agree that Donald Trump actually won that election in, in the sense that he got a majority of the Electoral College vote and nobody stole any of it, right? If we can agree on those facts, then we can have a conversation about why did he win? Now, that conversation about why he won has to involve talking about structural factors, talking about how uh, capitalism conditions people and how it brings out in them various forms of behavior and generates various cultural movements. The issue is that there are some people who really don't want to have that conversation. So first they go, OK, if we're going to concede that Donald Trump actually won the election, then we are going to say instead that it has nothing to do with the economy and its cultural backlash, its white lash. It's entirely about racial history and the American Civil War and the Confederacy. It has nothing to do with capitalism. It's all about particular uh, racial issues that taint what would otherwise be a perfectly functioning liberal capitalist system. And then there's another group that can't even get this far, can't even acknowledge that Donald Trump actually won the election because the fact that Donald Trump won the election does too much to destroy their view of the country that they live in, who they are, who the American people are. They can't actually accept that the American people are capable of voting for Donald Trump. So they posit that there's some kind of conspiracy that accounts for the fact that it appears as if this occurred. And it's because they have a very difficult time accepting that reality. Uh, that's what I think is really going on there. Now, we so, can get into to the clarify, then, with them and argue about their conspiracy theory. But right. as you know, most of the time when you argue about a conspiracy theory, you are lending weight to the whole lens of discussion that they've uh, kicked up by agreeing to engage it on, on their terms. It's like, why would you want to sit there and argue about whether jet fuel can melt steel beams? Well, you I mean, it, talk more well, about the actual, uh, you know, why would somebody commit 9-11? Why would the state, you know, why would that happen? Who would be right. interested in doing that and why? What is it that we're trying to avoid talking about when we suggest that George W. Bush is actually behind 9-11? What we're trying to avoid talking about is that we have a foreign policy that has angered a lot of people in a very substantive way. People who have some level of capacity to commit criminal acts because they don't like our foreign policy and the way we've been behaving. Well, if you um, take, you can believe in a conspiracy that it happened. And sometimes conspiracies happen, right? But if you stop there and say, oh, the problem is these bad actors, then you are engaging in conspiracy theorizing as a, an explanation for the world. But if you say, well, um, the re let's say with Russiagate, the reason why Putin and Trump were able to, uh, to collude together successfully was because of the 2008 crisis, which bred so much inequality in the nation and set up a lot of resentment that then these two together were able to exploit and were willing to exploit in a way that uh, you know, those who are more loyal to the American project would never do. Then, then that's a conspiracy theory that also includes a structural critique. Right. And so maybe it could be proved out to be true and it would take in the, the background conditions and wouldn't merely be a conspiracy theory. Is, is, would that Even be if, right? it, if it was the case that Putin in some way intervened to help Donald Trump win the election. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, say that he did. Uh, and that and the end that was decisive. They, they colluded together. They planned together. They had a, they, they right. worked it all out in 1987 in a hotel room and, and sure. peed on Trump and all of that happened, right? Say all of that is true. Mm -hmm. uh, there's still a question of why is it that they were able to get enough people to vote for him by doing that stuff? Why is it that right. that stuff worked? Uh, and if we don't look into you know, why did that stuff work and we just get angry at the particular people that we associate with acts that happen or with events that happen, uh, then we never really get into what actually is going on in the society. And I, I, this is why I, in general, I try to avoid getting into the weeds about what actually happened, what the set of facts are, because when you get into those weeds, whatever you say, you get accused either by one side of being a stooge for this, by another side of being a stooge for that. It becomes all about you and whether you're on the right side, whether you have the facts or don't have the facts. 
most of the time I'm, I'm happy to just shrug and go, I don't know exactly what happened. I don't mm -hmm. know. Different people claim different things. What is interesting is, is why we're in this situation fundamentally, which is always going to go beyond particular people and, and, and what they said or did. There's always this question of why are particular people at this juncture motivated to act in this way? If, there, if it is the case that Donald Trump was a fundamentally disloyal person from the get-go, why were so many Americans so upset that they were willing to support somebody like that? No matter how bad he is, it just makes it a more interesting question. Why were so many people willing to support that person? And if you just go, oh, well, they've all been deceived by the Internet. That's the only reason. It's just the Internet. Uh, and then you try to stitch up the way the Internet works to prevent this, uh, this set of feelings from being expressed. Well, I think, A, uh, you're not going to prevent this set of feelings from being expressed. It's going to get expressed in different ways. If you block it in particular areas, it's going to come out in other, uh, in other ways. And this is what we always say about authoritarian states that restrict speech, that because they restrict speech, dissent doesn't get expressed. This means that the government doesn't know what's going on. It's not really attuned to how people are feeling. So when the dissent is expressed in demonstrations or in non-cooperation or in violence. The government is taken by surprise. Very quickly, things get out of hand. All of a sudden, you can discover that there's all this dissent that wasn't expressed and it can come out all at once. And that's how you get a more uh, overt kind of uh, kinds of revolutionary activity. The color revolution, our classic model for the color revolution, that's how it works. So why would we want to do things that are like that and, and suppress the dissent rather than engage with its causes? Well, maybe because we're playing fifth dimensional chess and we want to bring on a revolution. Listen, I'm going to uh, stop the first half there. And um, in the second half, we'll pick up a little bit more on this question of conspiracies, um, because I feel like that would be a enticing thing to promise uh, someone who's watching the first half of this conversation. But we'll also continue on discussing your book. Um, I have plenty of questions left directly related to your book. And Benjamin Skidbaker, thank you for, for being on the Diet Soap Podcast. Great to be here. If you enjoyed this conversation, please do consider supporting us on Patreon. Our patrons help to make sure that Sublation Media can continue to provide interviews, videos, books, and articles that are critical of the left from the left. If you are tired of remaining stuck within bourgeois ideologies and politics, Help us sublate them both.